Hi, Scott Harris King here. And uh, these days on YouTube, a lot of people are doing their top 50. They're showing off like the top 50 comics from their collection. So I thought that might be a, a fun thing to do. I've done videos in the past about my comic collection, but it's been a long time since I've actually looked at the heart of my collection. It's mostly been videos about new stuff I'm picking up. So this has been a, a fun thing to go back through my entire collection and sort of decide what books would really fit into a top 50. The criteria for me, uh, it's interesting, you know, I have a lot of valuable comics, but I also have comics that have sentimental value to me, uh, comics that are maybe important, even though they're not personally sentimental to me, you know, first appearances or other rare books, um, plus, you know, stories that I like. So there's a lot of factors that have gone into it. This is the top 50 I came up with today. If I went through my collection again, you know, a month from now or a week from now, I might end up with a slightly different list. But this is sort of an alchemy to decide just, you know, what's going to enter my top 50. So not all the books in here are, you know, super rare or super valuable. Um, but it's sort of a, a mix of um, books that are important to me for one reason or another or important to my collections. One other thing I've decided to do is to actually rank them. I mean, it's a top 50 list. I think you need to rank them in order. So I'm going to be counting them down, starting with number 50 and going to number one. My collection has had a lot of different uh, focuses over the years. I've changed from being about superhero books to these days it's mostly Archie and romance. So you're going to see kind of a, an interesting mix uh, in the books um, as we go through them. There's a lot of different genres, different time periods, different types of books as uh, my collecting tastes have changed. And we'll start with number 50. It's Dark Mansion Forbidden Love number one. As you can see, this is a CGC 5.0. When I first got into uh, collecting romance comics, I really was interested in these short run um, gothic romance series that DC did. Uh, this uh, was one of my big targets. Obviously, this is just a mid-grade copy, but I was really happy to have it. And the other one I was happy to get is number 49, the sister book. It's um, Sinister House of Secret Love, number one. This is a little bit of a lower-grade book, but I just really like these um, gothic romance series. And again, when I first really got into romance several years ago, these were the series that I sort of focused on first before I moved on to other things. So number 48, we have another romance book. It's Our Love Story number five. And this is a classic book um, because it has a great story by the legendary Jim Steranko inside that uh, you really need to see to understand. The art is just amazing. Uh, it's it's uh, too bad he didn't do more of these. So uh, 47, we got Strange Tales 135. This is the first um, S.H.I.E.L.D. story. And uh, this original story with S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, that started in this issue um, is just fantastic. It's also being serialized at the same time as the absolutely epic uh, Dormammu storyline in Doctor Strange um, by Steve Ditko. So like this run starting with this issue in Strange Tales is one of the best Marvel runs in all of Silver Age Marvel. Next up uh, we have a CGC 9.8 copy of Green Arrow number one by Mike Grell among other people. Grell uh, was writing this. This came out right after the Longbow Hunters. I'm a huge fan of Mike Grell. I love his run on Green Arrow, so I was really happy to uh, get this a couple years ago um, as a gift as part of a Christmas gift exchange. We have uh, Tales of Suspense 59, um, a classic Marvel book. This is where uh, Captain America his uh, series started here in issue 59 after guest starring 58. We might see that later on in the countdown. Uh, I was actually a little disappointed by the grade here with 6.5. Um, it had mostly to do with a little bit of tanning, uh, which they really hammered because structurally this book is really, really nice. Uh, I really thought that this was going to be more like a 7.5. 
But, um, you know, you win some, you lose some. Uh, just recent pickup for me. I'm a huge fan of boy comics. I have a complete run of boy comics, and we're going to be seeing a lot of issues of boy comics later on in my run. This is my highest grade uh, issue of the series. I just got this recently, and it's a CGC 9.0 copy of issue 33. This is, uh, for me, and just me, a key issue because it's the only issue in the run that has a Crime Buster logo on the book. Crime Buster was the main star of the series for all 117 issues, but he never got his own title. This is the closest he got. This is also the best era of the book. Um, the, the 30s and 40s um, are, are the best issues, in my opinion. So I was really excited to get this recently. We got Night Nurse number one. Um, I love a Night Nurse and not in an ironic fashion. These are some of my favorite Marvel stories from the Bronze Age. This four issue run of Night Nurse is absolutely great. I grew up watching a lot of soap operas with my grandmother and this is an absolutely 100% classic soap opera. Um, it's got romance, yes, but it also has a lot of interpersonal drama um, and a lot of action. Uh, a lot of melodrama. Uh, it's just really, really a great series. Absolutely love it. My copy is very low grade. Um, I have the rest of the run. My other issues are in much nicer shape. This one's very, very beat up. So it would be nice if I could upgrade at some point, but I don't really feel like spending the money on it. So I'm just really happy that I have this copy because I love the stories. So this is probably the technically the least valuable book you're going to be seeing in my top 50. It's Just Married, number 104. I have four copies of this book, and I, every time I see it, I buy another one. Um, you'd be surprised at how much this will actually go for to collectors in the know if it's in high grade, because there's so few truly high grade Charlton books, period, but Charlton romance in particular. This is a, a fantastic cover by Joe Statton, and uh, as soon as I saw this, it immediately jumped out to me because as far as I'm aware, this is the only mainstream romance book um, that features uh, an interracial kiss w between um, an African-American character and a white character. Uh, you know, the romance genre was huge from 1947 to 1977. It sold millions of copies. There were thousands and thousands of issues. I think this is the only one that shows um, to, that shows this. There are a couple DC books that have interracial romance covers, but there's no kissing. They're very sort of discreet. And um, there's a couple others that have, you know, other interracial... Um, Romances, uh, you know, with like a white guy and an Asian woman or um, a, a Latino guy and a white lady. This is the only one. And this is from 1975, just before the uh, end of the romance genre. Um, it's just a great cover and really bold and groundbreaking. And um, it's just one of my personal favorites. So even though... It's not really worth that much. It's definitely in my top 50. And uh, of all the romance books, it's the one that I look for the most because I just uh, just love it. I'm always looking for more copies. And then here's another romance, another Charlton romance. Um, this is off the radar for most people, but I saw this cover and I absolutely love it. Um, it's Sweethearts number 45. This is a late 50s book. Um, I have a nice mid-grade copy that presents better and with charlton's uh charlton romance from this era you can find the book above a five you're doing really well i uh, wish i'd learned that lesson a little bit earlier i missed out on a couple things because i thought i could find nicer copies no you you can never find nicer copies so if you find a nice copy just just get it this is just a great great cover um by vince coletta actually who has a terrible reputation as an anchor among you know Marvel and DC fans, but among Charlton Romance fans um, and also Atlas Romance fans, 
you know, the Vince Coletta is, is a serious talent. Um, he worked a lot with Matt Baker. You can see the clear Matt Baker influence in the male figure here. Um, I'm not saying that Baker necessarily worked on this cover, but if he didn't, then it was an instance of Coletta uh, clearly copying him, which he did at times. But the two work together, and this is just, I loved it. As soon as I saw this, uh, I had to have it. So continuing on with the countdown, here's book number 40. It is Captain America number 111 uh, with the classic cover by Jim Steranko. And um, this is a personal favorite of mine. Uh, I have a, a high grade copy here. It's um, structurally great. It's got a little bit of tanning. You know, you can see it's an off-white. Tanning is not really the right word, but with these white covers, it's so hard to find this one in particular with a pure white. Uh, so this is more of an off-white. Uh, that's, the, that's the main issue with it. So, uh, But structurally, it's really nice. I'd probably have this book uh, around an 8. Um, and uh, I just love Steranko. Which brings me to number 39 in my countdown. Um Again, it's sort of an off-white now, but this is his classic cover for uh, Strange Tales 167 with the flag cover. Again, I have a, a really structurally high-grade copy. It's got a little bit of a, an issue on um, the edge here. It is very common for these Strange Tales to have a ragged edge because uh, the theory is that they were being printed right at the end of sort of they're like the last book being printed so by the time this came off the rolls the the blade was dull so a lot of these books will have this it's not really marble chipping but it's sort of a a ragged uh cut edge almost like a charlton book um but yeah so this is this is probably an 8.5 maybe maybe even a nine um i had a, saw this on the wall of my lcs a number of years ago and just had to have it bought it immediately uh and haven't regretted that at all So here's a bigger ticket book. Um, these days, it's uh, Archie's Girls, Betty and Veronica, number 41. It's a CGC 7.0. Last I checked, which is a while ago, this was tied for the second highest graded behind a single 7.5. And this has one of the two classic Harry Lucy covers. Um, the one for issue 40, uh, where they're working out like in their gym clothes, is... Um, the more desirable the two, it's it's uh, the, the higher higher price. But this is um, much to my surprise in the years since I got this. It's uh, drastically increased. I'm a huge fan of Harry Lucy. I think his work is really underrated. So I'm I'm happy to see that there's been a big surge in interest in his work, uh, particularly his covers with Betty and Veronica from the mid to late '50s and very early '60s. Uh, I don't collect Betty and Veronica, but I, I got this in a, a Christmas gift exchange um, online several years ago. And uh, as soon as I saw it, I knew this is what I wanted because I, I, I'm a big Archie fan and, and um, I just love Harry Lucy. Continuing on, uh, Special Marvel Edition 15, First Appearance of Master of Kung Fu. This is a nice mid-grade copy that I uh, got. A little while ago, I've been putting together a full run of Master of Kung Fu. I got down to two issues left. I didn't spend more than a dollar on any of them, except for this one. This is one of the two that I had left at the end. I spent like $3 on the other one I needed, and then I bought this. Um, at the time, it was $40. That was before the movie was announced and all this stuff. I think it was a really good deal even at the time. It's a mid-grade book. I have it you know, around 5 5.5 maybe. So um, I'm happy to have this. I love the Marvel's Bronze Age sort of explosion of new characters and ideas from the early to mid-70s. You're going to see a lot of first appearances in my stack here. This is just the first of them. Here's another. It's uh, Marvel Premiere 15 with the first appearance of Iron Fist. This is a low-grade copy. It's a 2.0. I got this in a trade um, a couple years ago. I'll be talking more about this trade later because they... There's multiple books in my pile here that I that I got in this deal. 
Um, I had a higher grade copy at one point, but I sold the uh, higher grade one and, and I kept this one. Um, here's a copy of Lobo number one. Uh, this was uh, it's a very rare uh, comic from the mid '60s. It's the first comic uh, solo series starring an African American lead character. Um, it was received very little distribution. Uh, a lot of the distributors and chains refused to carry it. So there, the estimate is that only about 10% of the copies of the book even made it onto the stands for people to buy. So it's very rare, very important historically. I found this at a comic store uh, for a very good deal a few years ago as soon as I saw it in my collection. Here's uh, Luke Cage, Hero for Hire, number one, first appearance of Luke Cage. Um, again, this is part of my sort of Bronze Age Marvel first appearance, first issue, uh, sub-focus in my collection. I also got this in the same trade where I got the first appearance of Iron Fist. And um, that was a deal, just real quick, where I got a book, I found a book in a dollar bin at a comic store that I where I knew it was worth a lot more. I ended up trading it for several hundred dollars worth of cash and comics. Um, some of those comics I no longer have. I ended up trading those off as well for another book that you'll see later on. But uh, I kept a couple of them. I kept the first Iron Fist. I kept this first appearance of Luke Cage. And that has turned out to be a really, really uh, good decision on my part. Doctor Strange 169. This is a mid-grade copy, but it has really bright, nice colors. When I was young... Um, Back in the late 80s, I had a super high-grade copy of Doctor Strange 169. There was a period where I was sort of semi-speculating on the first issues of runs, like Captain America number 100, books like that, where they had the title had changed. Uh, and so it was basically, this is like the first solo issue of Doctor Strange. And I picked up several of them. At that time, I wasn't really into Doctor Strange. Um, it was just more of, of as an investment, and I eventually sold that. I picked this up a few years ago when I really started getting into Doctor Strange, and while it's not nearly as high grade as the other one, this is probably a 5.5, the colors are great. And um, let me tell you, this book, if you find a copy with nice colors, it just is absolutely eye-popping in, in person. It's just the colors on this just look fantastic. Uh, I wish I could show you the copy that I originally had because it was like it just came off the printing press and it just like would burn your eyes out of either sockets because the color was so nice. But I'm really happy with this one because it presents so nicely for the grade. Mentioned this one earlier, Tales of Suspense 58. This was um, sort of the tryout book. Uh, before the next issue when they went full-time to a split book. So this guest stars Captain America. Most of the story is not actually Captain America. <clears throat> it's someone in disguise, so blah, blah, blah. But it's got this absolutely classic cover on it. Um, so, uh, you know, this is a nice um, mid-grade, like 6.5, maybe a 6. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just really dig this... Uh, cover so much. Here's Girls Romances number one. Um, Girls Romances is one of the big seven DC series, but um, they had seven very long running romance titles at DC, but they didn't all start at DC. Um, several of them started at other companies um, like Quality and uh, Crestwood, but Girls Romance was like... Um, part of the wave of the first DC romance book. So this is like girls love stories, girls romances. Um, and um, I think falling in love was a little bit later, but um, so this is girls romances. Number one, it's, it's uh, not as key or valuable as something like um, young romance. Number one or something like that. But uh, as far as, you know, D collecting DC romance books, this is a, is a big key. 
So here's uh, my copy of Captain America 117, the first appearance of Falcon. And I've had this comic for a very long time. Um, when I put together my full run of Captain America back in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, this was one that I desperately wanted because I always thought it was massively undervalued. That's no longer the case. Um, things have finally, you know, took 30 years, but popular opinion finally caught up to me. I wish I had bought more copies because I love this book. Um, also, my copy, as you may notice, has writing all over the cover. Um, but that's writing that I had put on the cover because, as you can see here, um, let me just show you there, um, it is signed to me from Gene Cohen. I had a chance to meet him not long after I got this comic. So while for most people that would detract from the value, I'm not planning on selling it. And uh, I'm really glad I had the chance to meet Gene Cohen and tell him how much I liked his comics. Um, so it has a lot of sentimental value to me as well as monetary value. Uh, here's a high grade copy of Marvel Super Heroes number eight. It's the first appearance of the unbeatable Squirrel Girl. I absolutely love Squirrel Girl. I thought her series at Marvel, uh, which just ended recently, was the best thing Marvel was putting out. I was really disappointed when it ended. I was, on the other hand, extremely happy to find this in a 50 cent bin at a comic store just a couple years ago after the book had already broken out quite a bit. So, um, yeah, I was really, really pleased to get this. I love the character, so I was really happy to add that to my collection. And uh, here is first issue special number eight, the first appearance of the Warlord. I'm a huge fan of Warlord. One of the first comics I ever started reading and collecting was Warlord. And uh, I just absolutely love the character. You can see down here, I have signed my copy signed by Mike Grell. I am hoping to get some high grade copies of um, first issue special number eight and Warlord number one for my collection as well. I have my issue one is also signed by Mike Grell. Um, but yeah, I love Warlord. Uh, I think this is a really underrated book. And, um, I also have a theory that we're going to be seeing Warlord and Aquaman too. So, uh, I should probably go ahead and, um, get more copies of this before our, it gets out of my price range. <clears throat> We are book number 27 on my top 50 countdown of my collection. It's Young Romance number 150. Um, to me, this sort of, this cover is just an all-time classic, J. Scott Pike. And it basically sums up romance comics right there. This is the cover for me. If you look at romance just in general, but specifically DC, Silver Age DC, this is it. I've been lucky enough to have three copies of this, but none of them have been higher than mid-grade. This is the nicest of the three, is about a 5.5. And uh, they've used this cover on all sorts of you know, postcards and posters and book covers and promotional stuff because it's just, it's iconic. This is a little less well-known, but... Uh, a lot harder to find in nice shape, I think. This is Girls Love Stories number 52. It's from um, the late 50s, so it's significantly earlier than um, the the Young Romance 150. And it's got this um, cover of this greaser, um, you know, kissing this woman. And it's got this just fantastic, uh, it's like pastel sort of washed out, you know, sort of foggy background with the neon signs. It's absolutely great. I have two copies of this. This one is probably about an 8.0. Um, as soon as I saw it in this condition, I was like, I'm going to the mattresses for this one. And I did. I paid for it. Uh, but this is a cover where it started to get some attention the last couple years. It hasn't quite broken out maybe as much as I think it should, but I think it's coming because... It's just a classic. Also classic, it's uh, Conan number 23, the first appearance of Red Sonja. I, you know, debated whether to include 23 or 24 or both. 24 obviously has the incredible classic cover from Barry Windsor Smith. But this is the first appearance of Red Sonja. 
Um, it's a full appearance. Don't let anyone fool you. Red Sun, uh, Conan 24 is not Red Sun, his first appearance. It's in here in Conan 23. This is from an original owner collection. It's pretty high grade. Um, I have it probably in the uh, 8.0 range. So it's, it's a nice one. I just recently picked this up. I have a second copy that's, you know, much lower grade. But uh, I'm a big fan of Red Sonya, especially her first two appearances in issue 23 and 24. So um, I'm really happy to have this. Here's Avengers number 8. Uh, this is a higher grade copy. I have it at about an 8.0. And it's the first appearance of Kang the Conqueror. My favorite villain. I love Kang. This is the third copy of Avengers 8 that I've owned. The other two are long gone and hard to find at this point. I have a long convoluted story about how I got this, but it was the result of a sequence of trades, which at the time didn't necessarily seem to work out in my favor, but uh, this book has really taken off recently, and I think, I'm, I think I did okay for myself. The short version is I bought way back, uh, probably in 1989, Right around the time the Batman movie came out, I got a high-grade copy of Batman 171 that I paid $20 for. Traded it at a show after it blew up following the movie to um, to a dealer for high-grade copies of Spider-Man 39 and 40. Uh, the 39 was probably a 7.5, and the 40 was probably a 9 or a 9.2. I subsequently traded those two for Avengers 7 in about a 5.5 and this copy of Avengers 8 because I'm a huge Avengers fan and not so much with Spider-Man. So, um, you know, uh, uh, it's one of those things um, where I knew that I was coming out a little behind money-wise, but I really wanted to upgrade my totally trash copies of Avengers 7 and 8 at that point. And... Um, so, uh, yeah, but the important thing is I love Kang, absolutely love Kang, and uh, this is one of my higher-grade early Avengers. Journey into Mystery 89, I uh, went on a big... Th Thor was the first comic that I collected from Marvel, and um, a number of years ago I went on a big Thor kick and almost completed the series. I got down to just four issues left. I was missing 83, 84... 85 and some random issue like 94 or something and um read th through most of them and realized i just didn't love it the way i needed to love it to be spending that kind of money so i sold most of the run i did keep my early big logo journey into mystery issues um so i have most of those still uh, but um, while there's others that I really like, like 102, this with the classic cover from Kirby is probably my favorite. This is a nice, very well presenting mid-grade copy, probably in the 5.5 to 6 range, might, might make a 6. Um, and I might be underselling it, but it's just a beautiful comic. Here's a Conan the Barbarian number one. This is from the same original owner collection that I mentioned. I there's I recently had a chance to get several early Conans. Uh, the collector actually had the whole run of Conan up through issue 30 or 40, but I had most of them already. I but I was lucky enough to pick up issues one to seven, as well as uh, 23 and 24. Um, and they had all been bought off the newsstand and kept in nice shape. This isn't quite as nice as the 23. It's got a couple, um, it's got like a thumb bend at the top and a small tear, very, very tiny micro tear and, and uh, non-color break increase on the back. Anyway, I think it's about a seven. Um, Conan, again, is one of the first titles I collected as a kid, so it's got a soft spot in my heart. It also has just fantastic story and art from Roy Thomas and Barry Windsor Smith. And um I'm down to just like five issues to finish the entire run. So uh, this is a very recent, very recent acquisition, um, but it immediately slots right into my top 20, uh, well, top 25. 
Uh, it's also, along with Tomb of Dracula, number one, another Bronze Age book. A lot of people think Conan, number one, is like the first book to signal the start of the Bronze Age. Um, I got this probably 10 years ago now. Uh, it's about a 7.0, just absolutely beautiful colors. Classic cover from Neil Adams. I just had to have it in my collection because I love the cover so much. This is a series I was trying to put together on the cheap. Um, like I did Master Kung Fu, I've got, I don't know, probably 30 issues that I managed to get for about a buck each. That's That run is never going to be completed um, unless, you know, I find an issue 10 at a flea market. I don't have a number 10. But I did splurge on this a number of years ago. Um, I paid $38 for it at the time and um, uh, pretty pleased with that. But it's just every time I look at it, I just... I have to smile because it's just like it so much and uh, the colors are so bright and vibrant on this copy that uh, it's really really cool all right now we're into the top 20 you ready for the top 20 books so here we are captain america number 100 mid-grade copy probably a 5.5 or a 6 this i've had this for a long time as i mentioned i completed my full run of captain america quite a long time ago and uh, so this is, you know, one of the key issues, obviously, from that run. Uh, here is a CGC 4.0 copy of Boy Comics number six. This is classic Iron Jaw cover. And um, I got a good deal on this. A uh, number of years ago, when I first got into Boy Comics, this was like my first big expensive purchase. And um, I was, I had it graded at about a three. I was very happy when it came back as a four. And uh, it's just a great um, early classic Iron Jaw cover. Um, it's not that easy to find. It prevents, presents really well. It's just a, it's just a great comic. Uh, here's my copy of um, Super DC Giant 21, a.k.a. Love 1971, with this awesome classic psychedelic uh, cover here. Um, I got this just a, just a couple years ago. I uh, got a good deal on, on eBay. It's a lower grade. It's probably around a 4.5, but um, it looks great. I have it on display uh, here in my office, so I can just enjoy it all the time. Uh, here's my copy of Boy Comics number 9 with uh, another classic cover. It's got just about everything. I mean, everything going on on it. It's got the Statue of Liberty. It's got Iron Jaws floating head dripping blood from where he just bit someone to death. Um, it's got the just totally bizarro villain character, He She, which is a person who's split directly down the middle. Um... And, uh, yeah, so this is a book that, uh, again, along with issue six, this is one of my first big purchases with Boy Comics. And uh, I'm really glad that I got it because it doesn't come around that often. The copies of this book tend to stay in people's collections once they have it. So uh, this is a lower grade copy. Again, it's probably a 3.5, um, but just really happy to have it. And going with issue 9 is issue 10. Uh, a lot of people consider Boy Comics uh, 9, 10, and 11 to sort of be a set because they all have classic covers. Uh, didn't bring my copy of 11 is not going to be in this countdown. It's incomplete. I'm missing a couple interior pages that don't affect anything I care about. Um, so, But it didn't make my top 50 as a result. But here's a um, restored. I'm putting that in air quotes because it's extremely minor, like a bit of glue on the the cover um 1.5 copy of boy comics number 10 with the the classic cover here of uh iron jaw attacking the world really hard to find period uh particularly because of the black cover it's hard to find in the grade which this isn't but this was one of the last issues of the series that i got to complete my run and uh my traded for it i mentioned that trade earlier same trade in which I got the um, 
first appearance of Iron Fist and the first appearance of Luke Cage, I had received a couple other books in there, including a Spider-Man 122 that I turned around and I traded for this copy of Boy Comics number 10. So considering I only spent a dollar on the original comic that started that chain of trades, I am very, very happy with that. Here is my copy of WoW Comics 38. Classic Golden Age comic with a classic cover. Um, I bought this copy off of the CGC forums in 2012 or 13 um, for $65. Advertised as a 6.5, I think. Uh, I personally have it a little bit higher, but um, it's structurally fantastic. It does have some tanning, and I'm not great with that, as I've seen in some of my other books. CGC does tend to hammer that, so in terms of CGC grade, maybe a 6.5 is about right for this. Um, but mm, it's just so beautiful, and it's tight, and uh, so I personally have it a, a little bit higher. Um, and this book is just absolutely taken off in value since I got it, uh, no pun intended. Uh, I got it just because I love the cover, and it certainly wasn't meant to be like a long-term investment, but it's gotten so valuable now um, because again like some of these other ones once they're in someone's collection they don't come back out that I have considered selling or trading it just because um, it's just gotten much more valuable than I was expecting and so I could get some really good trade for it but for now I just I love the cover uh, you know a lot and besides romance comics I like to collect books with um, you know female heroines I have a number of other issues of WoW comics, so uh, I'm really happy to have been able to enjoy this in my collection for so many years now. Uh, Star Spangled War Stories, number 151, is the first appearance of the Unknown Soldier. Please don't let anyone tell you otherwise. The appearance in um, Sergeant Rock 168, um, that's was later retconned into being the unknown, this unknown soldier. Um, and it's a perfectly seamless retcon, so I don't have any problem with that. But his first appearance is here. This is one of my all-time favorite series, one of my favorite Bronze Age series. Um, I love these Bronze Age first appearances. This doesn't quite hold the same cachet as some of the other books that I've shown. Uh, but for me, it's very hard to beat Unknown Soldier in terms of just the quality of the stories. I love the character. And um, I just love having this. Uh, here's my copy of Avengers 57. It's probably about a 6.0. A lot of that, though, is because it's very dirty, particularly the back cover. I think if I got this cleaned and pressed, I could get up to about a 7.5. I'm not sure it's really worth my time and money to do that. Um, I bought this when I was a kid. Um, there was an advertisement in the want ad for a guy in Boston who was selling his collection. So my dad drove me down there cause I was too young to drive. And uh, we went up to this guy's attic and he had like full runs of every Marvel series from about 1965 up to the early eighties. And, uh, I spent all the money I had on Avengers back issues including this issue of Avengers uh, that I spent $10 on. Again, it's, a, it's about a six. Structurally, he's great, beautiful color, and I love the vision. He's one of my favorite characters in all of comics. So I was just really thrilled to get this. Um, plugged a big hole in my collection and was a key part to help me, me finish my Avengers run. Uh, so, yeah, I love this book. Here's Fantasy Quarterly, number one. It's the first appearance of ElfQuest. Uh, there are very few comics that had as big an effect on me as a kid as ElfQuest did. Um, I don't really follow it anymore, but the original series, the original storyline, still holds up. It's absolutely fantastic. This issue came out before the ElfQuest series, um, and it's this is a high-grade copy, but most copies of this book are high-grade. Uh because they actually had a number of unsold copies um, that 
they later sold through the letter column. So they had like a large portion of the print run was, was sold basically um, as mint back issues. So it's not that hard a book to find. It's a hard book to find, but not to find in high grade. As a result, um, I got this a long time ago for $40, like a long time ago. And uh, I'm really happy to have it. I love ElfQuest. I think this is a really underrated book. Um, and here's my Tales of Suspense 57, the first appearance of Hawkeye. Like Vision, Hawkeye is one of my favorite, absolute favorite uh, superhero characters, one of my favorite characters in comics. I just love Hawkeye. And uh, this is the second copy of this that I've owned. I had one that I got back in high school, and at some point, I don't remember why or when, but I sold it. But I picked this back up a number of years ago when I first really got back into comics after a hiatus about 2007, 2008. I got back into collecting after many years. And uh, at that time, I had a fair number of X-Men back issues, and I decided I really didn't care about X-Men. I brought them to the show. And I had a copy of uh, X-Men 101. Um, I was probably a 9.0, but it had significant issues with the page quality. And I traded it for this. This is uh, mid-grade. It's probably a 5. Um, it looks a little bit better, but there's a tear on the back cover. Uh, small small tear, but um, so it's about a 5. So yeah, I traded uh, my X-Men 101 straight up for this. And... Um, haven't regretted that at all. All right, you ready for the top 10 books? Coming in at number 10, it's Green Lantern and Green Arrow, number 76. Emphasis for me on the and Green Arrow part, because I'm a huge Green Arrow fan. Uh, as you can see, this is a CGC Signature Series 5.5. Five. I mentioned a while ago that uh, I got back into comics around 2007. And uh, what I did was I sold off a big chunk of my collection, stuff that I didn't really have an interest in any longer. And I took that money to start buying some key issues and stuff that I um, really wanted. This was one of the first purchases. At the time, I bought this off of eBay for, um, bought it raw off of eBay for $106. It was the most money I'd ever spent on a comic at that point. Um... I later had a chance to meet Neil Adams, obviously, and get him uh, to sign this book for me. Um, and uh, I just, um, it's just an all time classic. I love Green Arrow. So, book number nine is Sergeant Fury and his Howling Commandos, number one. This is uh, about a three or a 3.5. I got this um, just a couple years ago off of eBay. Uh, cost me, you know, <clears throat> a bit of money. Um, but again, I took some money. I would sold off part of my collection that I was no longer interested in. I had already completed the rest of the run of Sergeant Fury. I just needed issue one. So uh, I got this. Obviously, it's the first appearance of Nick Fury. Um, it's a book that I think is still a little underrated in terms of uh, value and, you know, Nick Fury's importance to Marvel and uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Um, so I was really pleased to to pick this up. Side note, this is the second copy of this I had when I was young, back in the 80s. I bought a copy at a flea market for $20, and uh, I don't remember what happened to it, but at some point I sold it off. Obviously, I wish I hadn't done that. Here we are, book number eight on the countdown. It is Jughead number one. Uh, I'm a big fan of Archie Comics, specifically Jughead. I love Jughead. I currently have a full run of Jughead starting issue 84. So it's 84 up to 352. Uh, all 216 issues of, uh, or 214 issues of volume two, a complete run of volume three. So I have all the Jughead issues from around 19... 59 or 1960 <clears throat> up to present day and I have a smattering of the older ones um, I got very lucky with this copy of Jughead number one on eBay several years ago I don't know just nobody else to be paying any attention or something because I got it dirt cheap um, it's very low grade I'd say it's a 1.0 it's complete everything's attached 
Um, the spine is just completely broken in several places. So if I took it out of here, it would just flop around like a piece of spaghetti. Um, but uh, I'm super happy to have this. Um, it kind of getting this so cheap so early in my Jughead collecting sort of allowed me to decide it was possible to put the whole run together. If I hadn't gotten this first issue, I might not have thought I would be able to do it. But with this big one out of the way, uh, I've been plugging full steam ahead and I'm really happy with my decision to collect Jughead because I love the stories. They're just great. Book number seven. It is All-Star Western number 10. It's a CGC 7.0, as you can see. Um, I submitted this myself raw. And uh, this is about what I was expecting um, when I did it. Um, my story with this is when I was a kid in the 80s, my dad had a business partner who had a giant collection of comics from the 70s that... Um, one thing or another, I ended up acquiring the whole run. It was about a thousand comics from between like 1973 and uh, 76. And um, this was not among them. However, most of the run of Weird Western with Joan Hex was in that. And I just really liked the stories. I really dug it. And I really wanted to get Joan Hex's first appearance and complete that run. And, uh, I went to my local comic shop um, in Worcester. That's entertainment. And this was about, uh, this was, I think was in 1988. And they had a copy. I did not have any money. So I went back to school. I, went, I at that time was attending a private church school. And so I talked to the youth pastor. And I said, you know, I really need to borrow $15 to buy this comic book. Um, luckily he was a hardcore baseball card collector, so he understood the need to get this. So, uh, yeah, that's the weird story of how I got this. My youth pastor lent me $15 to buy this comic in the late eighties. And, um, when I got back into collecting around 2008, I, uh, sent it to CGC and had it encapsulated. So, um, yeah. Here we are, book number six. It's Strange Tales 110, the first appearance of Doctor Strange. Uh, this is a very low-grade copy. It's probably a 1.5. Um, it's got some brittleness and severe tanning. You can see the bottom corner here is, like, chipping away. Um, this is one of the most recent acquisitions in my collection. I just got this a couple months ago, and uh, I was at a comic book show, and there was a dealer that had a bunch of unpriced comics and I pulled this out because I'm trying to put together a full run of Doctor Strange and I missed the boat on this before the movie hype uh, so I pulled this out and I was like you know how much do you want for this and uh, he said ten dollars so yeah Here we are. It's Marvel Spotlight on Ghost Rider number five. I want to bring this in close so you can see just how sharp this book is. It's, uh, it's so hard to get a nice copy with this black cover. The only issue with mine is actually up here in the Marvel Comics group. There's a tiny tear uh, right there and a little bit of a crease that runs up from that flap. So as a result, you know, I showed this to the people on the CGC forums, the consensus was this is probably a seven as a result of that defect. It's absolutely gorgeous. This is a comic that I got a long time ago. Um, I really got into Ghost Rider around the time that the new Ghost Rider series started. I think that was in 1990. Uh, and um, the only regret that I have is that there were two copies. The dealer had two copies of this. The other one was actually nicer than this one. It was probably a nine. And um, he wanted $25 for that copy or this one for 20. And being a kid on an allowance, uh, I wanted to save that $5 so I could buy more comics. Um, so the book would be worth a lot more if I had the slightly nicer copy, but I love this comic. And I just, it's one of my favorite covers. I just love it so much. Um, yeah. 
book number four, it's Action Comics 252. It's uh, the first appearance of Supergirl. I'm a big fan of Supergirl as a character. A lot of her stories are really crappy, but I, I'm a big fan of the character. I got this from my uh, LCS a few years ago. Um, it has uh, a tear seal, a small tear. There's a tiny tear here with an amateur tear seal on the inside, um, which I could have removed easily enough. Uh, it's just not worth the money to me because I'm not planning on reselling it. Um, other than that, there's no um, restoration. It's probably about a 2.5. It's a solid book. It does have some writing on the cover, um, but you may notice the kid who owned this copy as a child is a Dennis Kitchen. So uh, I love uh, actually having kids' signatures on books. Um, it just reminds me of my childhood, and I really like it. But having a, like a, a, figure, a historical figure from comics having previously owned this copy as a kid um, just adds to the value for me personally. Um, and so, yeah, you know, I, I, this is, I spent more on this comic than I've spent on any other comic in my collection, but it was a number of years ago. So at this point, you know, it's obviously gone up a significant amount since I purchased it. Um, but I just, I just love it. Uh, yeah. Top three. Now these top three all have personal stories for me. This is Boy Comics number three. It's the first appearance of Crime Buster. Uh, Crime Buster is my maybe my favorite character in comics. I self-publish my own continuation of Boy Comics starring Crime Buster, write and draw it. And um, I almost included a copy of that in my top 50 because it's just an absolute dream come true for me to um, have put out my own comic um but i was really inspired to do it by how much i love the character of crime buster and uh the series boy comics ran for 117 issues over 14 years um this this issue's from 1942 and eventually i got to the point where i was only missing issues three and four which are the first two issues of the series and my wife bought this for me for my birthday um it's a nice copy uh, structurally, it's about a nine, but it has um, serious uh, tanning on the covers um, and a very strong dust shadow front and back covers both. Um, it's absolutely flat and tight as a drum and just like structurally great. Uh, we got this, she got this from Metropolis, and so they had it at a 7.0. It's really hard to tell. Um, I think that's probably fair because without the tanning, I think it would be, um, a nine, maybe only an 8.5, but, um, so I think, you know, CGC really hammers tanning. So if this was CGC, they might give it a 6.5, but I think a seven is a reasonable grade for it. So it was quite expensive. Um, I was just thrilled to get it and uh, I can't thank my wife enough for it. There's book number two in my collection. Um, this is my extremely low grade copy of Avengers number four. Um, it is absolutely trashed. It's probably a 1.0. It does have, I guess you could call it amateur restoration, but it's mainly just damage. <laughs> because uh, when I got this, um, I went to a comic book store. I had just started collecting comics. I had just started collecting Avengers. I just wanted whatever the oldest issue they had. And this was the oldest issue they had. I'm not sure I really understood the significance of it yet. Because it was very early on in my collecting. It was $12.50. And my dad bought it for me. And um, when I got home, I read it. But the cover was... The, the spines all disintegrating. So the cover was coming off. Uh, the bottom part of the spine in particular. So, um, you know, I talked to my dad about it. I was like, I want to read, be able to read this, but I'm worried about it damaging it. So the solution we came up with was um, rubber cement. So, uh, yeah, we uh, rubber cemented the bottom part of the spine to the comic. Um, and this, this issue just holds a huge amount of sentimental value to me. My dad always supported my comic reading my comic collecting, he would drive me to all these stores and shows when I was a kid and buy me 
uh, comics, you know, for my birthday, as we're about to see in a second. Um, and uh, so I just, it means a lot to me, uh, very sentimental. Also, Avengers is my favorite superhero comic. So uh, it's obviously a key book, which brings us to my copy of Avengers number one. It's a CGC 3.0. Uh, frankly, I was very surprised that, at that grade. I thought it was a 2.0, but um, okay. It's kind of like when you play Monopoly and they have the bank error in your favor. Um, this was a comic that I received for my 14th birthday, and um, it was $80. There was a comic book show at the mall, and uh, they had this on the wall. A dealer had this for $80. Uh, and my dad had been thinking about getting me this beat-up old car for me to restore so that when I got to uh, driving age, I would have that. But I wasn't very mechanically inclined. So basically, he said, um, you can have one or the other. We can get you the car. Or we can get you Avengers number one. Um, that's how trash the car was. The, the $80 for this was the same value as a car. Um, and so uh, it was really no question for me. I was like, please, let's, I'll walk. Just get me the Avengers. So I got this copy of Avengers number one. It's been in my collection ever since. Uh, this was the summer of 1987 when we got it. And in uh, 1989, I had this uh, signed by Stanley. You can see in the notes there that it says, like, inside um, written Stanley. Um, there's a whole story about that. But um, yeah, so this is this is my Avengers number one. Well, I'll tell you that story real quick. Why not? The video is already six hours long. Um, I had read this book on comic collecting that said to be careful if you have any comics signed by Stan Lee because he pressed down so hard he sometimes would tear through the cover. So I really wanted to sign my Avengers, but I didn't want to risk him tearing the cover, so I didn't want him to write on the cover. So when I got, I was like terrified to meet him because he was my idol, and when I finally got to the front of the line, I put the book out, and I opened the front cover for him to sign, and instead of signing on the on the front page he signed on the inside front cover and so I was sure he was going to tear through it um but luckily he didn't um and then when I got back into collecting really for insurance purposes I had this graded so I could accurately get an insurance value in case something happened to it I do have photos that I took beforehand of the inside so I could see the Stanley signature and uh the end of this story is that Several years ago, um, now, over 10 years ago now, um, I did this thing where I realized I had all of the hallowed ranks of Marveldom, the uh, different ranks from the Mary Marvel Marching Society, except the fierce, Fearless Front Facer, which was a special designation that rumor has it only Stan Lee can give you. Um... And so you couldn't... There's no way to earn it. You have to be... It's like being knighted. So I decided to try and earn that, and I happened to know someone that was friends with Stan Lee, and I, I prepared this video where I told the story of getting, of deciding to get Avengers number one over a car because I loved it so much, and I got um, a personal email from Stan Lee uh, bestowing the title of Fearless Front Facer on me. So with all that being said, obviously there's a huge amount of sentimental value for me. I have no plans on ever getting rid of this comic. This would be the last comic out of my uh, collection. And uh, I just love it. So that's it. That's my top 50. I have already thought of a couple comics that should have made my top 50 for sentimental reasons or value. But I think this is a good representative um, look at my collection. And, and I hope you enjoyed it. And if anybody actually made it to this end of the video, thank you for spending a significant portion of your life with me.